Good morning, everyone. Hope all can hear. And if you're uh, tuned into the loop system, that you will revert to that now, so you'll be able to hear the service. We welcome everyone, whether gathered in church or watching online. Welcome to Banside Worship. Our uh, call to worship focuses today on the theme, the name of Jesus. And I invite you now to say the words that are on the screen from Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2, and we'll say these words together. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praises to your name, Most High. And that's what we're going to do now in our opening worship which is number 500, if you're using the hymn book. And it's God of grace, amazing wonder, irresistible and free. So we'll stand to worship God in the beautiful words of this lovely praise.
God, as we come to him in our prayers of adoration and confession, and then we'll all join together in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Amazing, compassionate, sovereign God, we marvel at your master plan for everyone. You loved and knew us long before the world began, sent our Savior down from heaven, perfect God and perfect man. What a gift of grace. God's loving mercy freely offered, freely given, free for all. Forgive us when we fail in word, thought, and deed, and also to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Teach us to be more like Jesus, to follow him as committed disciples. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who empowers us to live victorious lives day by day. As we unite to say the Lord's Prayer, deepen our trust in an awesome living God. We say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trials and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And at this stage, well, I see some of the, it's lovely to see children out. It's the summer holidays. Whether it's rain or sunshine, it is the summer holidays. So uh, it's lovely to see some out. And if you want to come a little nearer the front, into the front pew there with your family, if you want to, and any others of the youth, because I want to show you some things this morning, and I want you to help me so you can sit there. And then um, Sandra's going to be reading our Bible passage this morning, which is found in the Pew Bible. It's Mark 8. Uh, it's 100, 1012, and it's verses 27 to 30. And the background to this is or actually what this, these verses are all about. It's one of the greatest questions that Jesus ever asked. Peter says, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to a village near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus predicts his death the first time. Then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later, he would rise from the dead. And as he talked about this openly with his disciples, Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. This is the word of God for us today. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sandra. Well, that's lovely. I don't know if there's any more young people. And the young youth can stay and they'll probably be in church this morning because the sermon is quite simple and plain and there's a part in it for young people. Now, I don't know your names, so you can tell me your names this morning. Pardon? Ellis. Ida. Clara. Sophie, isn't that lovely? Now, this morning, I'm going to be introducing you to some people, and I'm going to be actually telling you their names. And this is Sarita. And Sarita lives in Bolivia, away in, I think it's South America. And I've got to know Sarita uh, about probably now 
18 years ago. I heard about Sarita through Compassion. And Compassion is a Christian organization that helps children in poverty who live in these countries. And I'm sure there's people in the church this morning, maybe you sponsor a young girl or a young boy. And uh, Sarita now is 14 years of age. Now, she would be horrified if she thought I was showing you this doll in church this morning. And uh, we'll just see what way she's working here this morning since her head has turned around. But anyway, um, I have learned so much from uh, sponsoring Sarita. It was something I was encouraged to do in my church in a youth group. The youth leaders, they had a little girl that they sponsored and they brought her photograph. And I never thought one day when I started work and years later that I would be sponsoring Sarita. I did sponsor somebody before that. And then when they come 18, they don't sponsor you anymore. Or maybe it's 22. So um, I'll be, I've helped you a little bit but you're going to help others. She wants to be a teacher and she wants to teach boys and girls. Now, she also has had the opportunity to go to a church and to go to a youth group. And she said that all those things have helped her in knowing about Jesus. So that's the first person that have you met this morning, Sarita from Bolivia. Okay, Sarita, will you sit there? Maybe you'll sit beside the flowers. That's a good girl. Now, the next person that I want to introduce you to, and they've traveled quite a bit, a uh, bit delicate. I have to hold on tight to them. They're from Kenya. And where I heard about this family, I wrote their name down here so I remembered, the Mwangi family. And they live in Kenya. And when I first heard about them was from Stephen and Angelina Cowan. Now, I'm sure they're known to you. They come from Luck Brickland. And I have kept in touch with Stephen's mother for many, many years. But they went out there to be missionaries. Do you think anybody in the church here could be a missionary someday? Maybe. Yes. Yes. Because being a missionary is just like any other job. Maybe you we were a teacher. You could be a teacher or a nurse or a doctor or working with IT and you would be needed to work in a foreign country. So they're in East Africa. And if they were here this morning, the Mwangi, this is Faith, the mother. They use a lot of names that we have. And this is John. And this little girl is called Mary. So they live, and the Cowans have been able, Stephen does a lot of work agriculturally. I remember one time being at the General Assembly and he had tractor parts on the stage and he said that this tractor was going out to Kenya. So he works alongside the, the men and the women and the boys and girls and then he tells them that there is a living God and there is a God who cares for them. And we're actually praying at the moment in Kenya that there'd be some rain. So that's another family you've met this morning, the Mwangi family. Okay? So because of the missionaries, and because I heard that you're to pray for these missionaries, I have learned a lot about Kenya. And the third person that I want to introduce you to is this lovely lady. Do you know where she's from? No, it's a country not too far away from it. India, you're correct. Yes. And this lady, I'm calling her Mary. And Mary, I met Mary at St. Combs College where I trained for deaconess work. And she came from India. She was a teacher. And she came to do some teaching experience in Edinburgh. And Mary became my prayer partner. And you know, I learned so much from Mary. That any time Mary, would, I would say, it's impossible to do all this studying. It's impossible to do all these exams. It's impossible to go to the churches. And she would say to me, nothing is impossible with God. And in fact, I had the privilege of going to her country one time. And Mary, uh, when she was growing up, she was a Hindu and she didn't worship the living God. She didn't know anything about Jesus. And then her mother took very ill. And some people prayed for her mother. 
and her mother got better. And Mary said, who did this? And the, the Christian said, we believe Jesus has done this for your mother. So Mary, and, and she was training to be a teacher then, she said, I want to know more about this Jesus. And she became a Christian, and then her mother became a Christian, and her father became a Christian, and I met them when I went out to India. Isn't she wearing a beautiful dress? This is a sari, as you know. And they carry the, the, the buckets of water or the lovely fruit, they carry that up here on their head. So that's another person we've met this morning. She's from South India. Her name is Mary. Actually, she had a Hindu name. And when she became a Christian, she changed her Hindu, her Hindu name to Jeshu Das, a daughter of Jesus. And Mary and I still keep in touch. She sends me texts and she sends me emails. And on my birthday, she always sends me a beautiful, beautiful uh, email. So, that's another country. So, what countries have we been to this morning? We've been to Bolivia. We've been to Kenya. And where was this country? India. So, when we think of the name of Jesus this morning, all over the world, boys and girls, young people, young people like you, maybe you will sponsor somebody like Sarita. Maybe you will pray for missionaries in Kenya. Or maybe one day you will go to a university or a college and you'll discover other Christians there. Now it's over to Ben because I know he has a special children's song for you this morning. Good morning. We're going to, we're going to sing the children's song that we did two weeks ago for Children's Day, I've Got Peace Like a River. And if you're out that Sunday, hopefully you'll remember some of the actions because I haven't remembered them all. Sarah, I know you'll remember them. So you can go back if you want, or you can help do some actions. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Peace, and I missed, missed you doing the actions again. So at this point, our young people can now go out, the, the children, I think. Is there something for them, or did they stay in? They go out, okay. As we come now to pray for others, I want you to think of the many names of Jesus. We've heard like peace, we've heard about love, we've heard about joy, we've heard about, you can think of the many, many names. And as we pray for our world, our broken world, we pray for our community, when some of our J29 will be going on, on, off on their holidays as staff. And as we think of the congregation here, I was thinking this morning of the comfort that our bereaved families need. And for those in hospital, for those at home, or for those looking after people at home, you are a part in praying for those people. 
So as I pray, and as you pray in your heart, God hears your silent intercession. And it all works together. People will say, oh, I felt better. There was an answer to prayer. Rain has come, will come to Kenya. It's all because we pray together as a church family. Let us pray. Father, as we stop now from thinking about ourselves and thinking about others, we ask that your Holy Spirit would inspire us how to pray. We pray for our broken, fragile, brittle world today where we've heard of terrible deaths, especially in Ukraine, in the shopping center, in the holiday area, the people who are still suffering from trauma, and for those who have come to other countries and are missing their families. We pray for your support of peace. We pray for reconciliation in Russia, and in other parts of the world where fighting still persists. So God of peace, God of reconciliation, come into the broken parts of our world. And we think of areas where there's hunger, and we think of the drought in Kenya, and the drought that has been in India. And Father, as Elijah prayed for rain, we pray too, and we pray that that will come. As we think of our community, Father, the needs are known to each person here this morning. We pray for Sarah and for Neil as they would plan their holidays and have a little break from the dedicated work that they do, that they would know rest and relaxation. And for the ongoing needs in our community, where people will beg on the streets, where people put little in their shopping baskets, and where people may not have the courage to go to a food bank, that we would be mindful of those around us, that we would pray for our neighbors, pray for our community, and pray that things will improve. And as we think of our congregation, we pray for families, for comfort for them, for those who miss that loved one in their home, in their life, in their family. We pray for those in hospital, for those at home or being nursed at home and in nursing homes. Lord, we pray that we would remember them daily, that we would support their families, that we would encourage them that you are there and you will never leave them nor forsake them. We pray for all on holiday, especially our minister and his family. We pray for others that we can get a break and for those living in these troublesome days when flights are cancelled and things are, are not normal, that we pray that normality will return. So we pray this all in and through the name of Jesus. Amen. And we're going to sing about that name, a very old hymn, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds in a Believer's Ear. Those who don't know Jesus don't know all the things that he can do for them. And in this hymn reminds us that he does speak in to our ear. So we will quieten our hearts as we sing this to God. In sweet the name of Jesus runs in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away our fear. It makes the Spirit home 
Father, we ask as we listen to your word, as we uh, ask you to teach us from your word, that you would take all distractions and that we would give this time now to you. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a baby, my dad used to say, so I'm told, how long will it be until she walks? And how long will it be until she talks? It made me think that conversation is one of the most wonderful skills we can possess. We are not born with it, but within weeks, then months, gurgling noises become syllables, then sentences, and eventually stories. Even children born deaf can communicate by learning to sign, aided by technology, to become brilliant communicators. Have you ever watched children or adults signing? It is so expressive, involving eye contact and other emotions, even silent laughter. Conversation is missing more and more from our decreasing time spent in even having a daily chat with someone, as texting is the new norm. The tongue has a lot to be responsible for, in good and not so good ways. Kindness can be replaced by brashness, exaggeration rather than reality, gossip than truth, and one could go on and on. But they are still the hopefulness of goodness, encouragement, forgiveness, and loving words often shared and expressed. And if you've been watching the tennis last night, sometimes there was more conversation than actually playing. But he's a wonderful player, and I mustn't condemn him this morning. But all of these words that I've been speaking to you about, the encouraging words, this, the words not even spoken, the touch, all of these heal wounds and mend friendships, assisted by the courage to right wrongs and practice Christian living. None of us are perfect. And these are the lyrics from Rag and Bone Man. I'm only human after all. I'm no prophet nor Messiah. I'm only human after all. Don't put the blame on me. It's interesting he declares he's not a prophet or a Messiah which today's sermon or teaching point is all about. It comes from one of the greatest questions Jesus ever asked. Who do people say that I am? Read to us earlier by Sandra. And then the same question asked personally, and what about you? Can you hear it coming from the master himself? And who do you say? that I am. Take a minute to ponder that. It would be interesting to hear each of your answers here this morning, but time does not allow. Rather, at a Bible study, you could discuss it, or over a cup of coffee, maybe afterwards, after church. You could say, what did you think about that? Or personally with a friend, when you can be open, that you have a time to ask questions, express doubts. Some of us have been there, wrestled with this age-old question, is there a God? Who is Jesus? Is he alive today? We are so thankful for our churches, for our youth programs, for our children's clubs after church, that that's an opportunity that they can ask you the question. I've been speaking to some of the leaders and they tell me, Doreen, the questions just come up automatically. And that's friendship evangelism. But then the question is, oh, I feel God. 
Would he use me? I failed him many times. I haven't grown in my Christian faith. And the answer to would God use you, use me, is a big, loud thumbs up. It's a yes. It's a sign of expressive hope. Max Lucado in his book, Max on Life, writes, in answer to the question, is God willing to use anyone to change the world, even people who fail? Uh, he says, just look at those he has already used. Take Bible characters, for example. Think of Moses. Think of Abraham. Think of Sarah. Think of David. And think of Peter. Because you're imperfect, you can speak of making mistakes. I've been there. And when we talk to our youth and they'll say, I couldn't be a Christian. I couldn't be holy all the time. And you can say, you don't have to be holy all the time. You can be like me, make mistakes and learn from the mistakes. Because you're imperfect, you can speak of making mistakes, what I'm after saying. And because you're a sinner, you can speak of forgiveness. God restores the broken and the brittle and then parades them before the world as trophies of his love and strength. As someone wisely said, the world sees the ungodly turn godly, and they know that God still loves them. What a thought. Seeing Jesus Christ lived out in another person can attract someone to him. Simply, he or she young or old, begin to discover who Jesus really is. That's what Peter, the disciple, the one who got it wrong at times, usually by saying the wrong things, or often putting his foot in it. But this time, he got it right. What music it must have been to Jesus' ears, that of all the disciples. It wasn't John who loved him deeply. But it was this brash Peter who answered the question and said, you are the Christ. The Christ in Greek and, uh, and the Messiah in Hebrew means the anointed one. The same name that Jesus received at his birth, the long-awaited Messiah, promised of old in the ages, pages of the Old Testament. Some of the Jews were waiting for a savior to deliver them from Roman rule. Another hoped for a Christ or a Messiah that would deliver them from any physical ailment. You and I know, or will discover more and more, that his work is far more reaching than anyone could imagine. The goal being, Jesus paid the price for sin and opened the way for peace with God. How amazing. He died that we might be forgiven. He died to make us good, that we might go at last to heaven, saved by his precious blood. The familiar words of There is a Green Hill Far Away by Cecil Francis Alexander. And in the words of Graham Kendrick, a 21st century worship leader, he wrote, amazing love. Oh, what sacrifice. The Son of God given for me. My debt he paid. My death he dies. That I might live. That I might live. Definitely something to sing about. Jesus' person, purpose in coming to earth, the true Messiah. It truly was a milestone for the disciples that day. From that point onwards, you can trace it in Mark's gospel, in the other gospels too, Jesus spoke plainly about going to the cross. He talked about his death and his resurrection. His conversation was about the cross and all that that would entail. But as you examine his journey to the cross, he didn't stop healing people, he didn't stop defending the helpless and the homeless, marginalized of society. He taught on a variety of subjects. 
it would be a fascinating thing to converse about all that was mentioned in Mark's gospel. But today, our focus has been on one question. Who do people say that I am? What would your reply be? What is mine? What would you tweet or text or hashtag? What wonderful arguments would you come up with? Or bewildering questions. What does the word Messiah mean to you? And how could it change your life? I conclude with the examples from three young people. And firstly, I want you to meet Martha Collison, better known as the youngest contestant on the Great British Bake Off. Remember that cookery program? She successfully reached the quarterfinals at the age of 17. And these are her words. At the age of eight, I discovered my love of baking, she says. My mother let me run riot in the kitchen. So I'm glad the eight-year-olds are all out. But that's what she loved to bake. And at any cost, her mother allowed her to do it really discovering that that was her gift. So she also says that at the age of eight, I also made a personal commitment to following Jesus. I made the bigger discovery of believing who Jesus is and what he'd done for her. Even in the intense pressure of the bake-off, when she was studying for her A-levels, she said many a time she felt like crumbling, but her faith kept her going. She also said, I love my church. It's full of family and friends and fun. And I'm thankful for mission opportunities to have gone to Cambodia to share baking skills with young girls there. Food is an excellent way of connecting with people, she said, and more so for her sharing who Jesus is. I'm going to introduce you to Gavin Peacock. I don't know him, but I've learned a lot about him in preparation for the sermon. He is the second person, and he grew up in a footballing family. Football was in his blood. At the age of 17, he had turned professional, playing in the Premier League for Newcastle United. He said, I had achieved my goal and a great career ahead, but something was missing. When I played well, he said, I was up. But when I didn't, I was down. He started to question at the age of 18, what was the purpose of life? And one Sunday evening, out of the blue, his mother decided to go to the nearby church, which was unusual, as his parents had stopped going to church. And Gavin decided to go along and to keep her company. After the service, the minister tactfully and wisely said, Gavin, would you like to come and meet the young people we meet every night after the Sunday service? He went along and he discovered that these young people were just ordinary young people, but they had something that he didn't have. They had a joy and a reality in their lives. And over the next weeks, he questioned who is this Jesus? Why did he come to earth? Is he interested in me, Gavin Peacock? And listening to their answers, he came convinced that Jesus was the promised Messiah or the Christ, and that had he needed him in his life. And he said he did a turnaround, so to speak, and he trusted in him. The change for him was immediate. Football, he said, had been my, been my God 100%. Now it fell into the right place. It wasn't God anymore. Jesus was central. And being a Christian shaped his attitude to both winning and losing. And after many years playing and broadcasting, he obeyed God's call to train as a pastor. And he now serves in Calvary, Grace Church in Alberta, Canada. So that, if you want to read his autobiography, um, Glory, Grace and Glory, it's worth 
a reed. The third person has to be a tennis star. I did try to research, and it, it said on Google that there was many people who were Christians. But I thought I would go for Lauren Davis from the United States of America. She began playing tennis at the age of nine, and she progressed to the third round of the Grand Slam. She was quite open about her faith, and when she won, she would give the thanks to God. And um, she said that even though she didn't win, uh, she didn't win the Grand Slams, she said that she was so thankful to Jesus in the tough and rough times of her life. Uh, so with these three people, along with so many more worldwide, they discovered that Jesus made the difference. And it can be the same for everyone. More so, it is the best question that you'll ever ask. It's the best question that you'll ever pursue. And you'll find, as these three people did, that God put people in their path to help them. Gavin said that he found that there was people looked out for him when he became a Christian. And Martha said she was guided to do mission work and to do Christian work. And Lauren Davis said that although she had many trials and ups and downs in her life, that God was her rock. So I invite us all to take a moment now before we sing our last praise. And I'll have a prayer prior to that. Just to question, who is Jesus to us today? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that your name means so much that in discovering who you are, that we discover that we are special to you, that we are unique, there's only one of us, and that you love us deeply. And you have a path and a plan for us, for every day of our life. And we thank you that we can pursue that, or we can ignore that, or we can make a second start and really be committed to you. So we thank you for your patience with us. We thank you for the prospects you have for us. And we thank you that your name is a name above all names. Amen. So our last praise is Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and ever hope to be.
Father, along with our offering and tithes, we offer ourselves to you this morning. And we pray for the gifts to sustain mission work, to sustain United Appeal, to sustain the running and uh, the upkeep of this church. We pray, Father, that when all is in perspective, well, then nothing ever lacks. And we give our lives afresh to you this morning because you are the one who have our dreams and our hopes and even our fears under control. Amen. And we say together, you'll see on the screen, it's the blessing. And it comes from Psalm 9, which was our call to worship. And it uh, reiterates again the name of Jesus. So we say this together. Those who know your name will trust in you for you. Lord, you have never forsaken those who seek you. And we say the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.